Good morning. I am Joe Nelson, president of the San Jacinto Battleground Conservancy. I want to welcome you to the 16th annual San Jacinto Symposium. We have an interesting day of African Americans in Texas history. This is the third in a series of symposia focusing on specific groups of people, Tejanos and Native Americans. But we do have, a first, a bit of housekeeping. In your packets that you received as you checked in, we do have evaluation forms. We would like you to fill those out and leave those with us as you uh, leave this afternoon. We also have a question and answer form, which we would like you to jot down your questions, save them till the end of the, till about four o'clock, and we will ask for those and answer all the questions at the same time. At this time, I would like to turn the event over to our co-moderator, Frank De La Teja, and uh, he will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it happens all the time, and, and it doesn't take much. Um, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I can think of uh, no better individual uh, to, pro to provide a sort of academic invocation for us uh, today than, than Merlene. Uh, Dr. Petrie is a professor of history and uh, former dean of the College of Liberal, and Behavioral, uh, B Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences at Texas Southern University. Uh, she's a former president of the Texas State Historical Association. Um, and uh, is the first African-American uh, to head that organization. Uh, she has published four books um, through many dangers, toils, and snares, The Black Leadership of Texas, 1868 to 1898, In Struggle Against Jim Crow, Lulu B. White, and the NAACP, 1900 to 1957, and the award-winning uh, Black Women in Texas History and Black Southern Women in the Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1965. Uh, Dr. Petrie currently serves as managing editor of the African American Handbook of Texas, uh, part of the Texas State Historical Associ Association's uh, online Handbook of Texas project. Uh, she is a fellow of the association and of the East Texas Historical Association. Um, in 2013, she was a recipient of the Lorraine A. Williams Leadership Award given by the Association of Black Women Historians. And in 2014, she won the Texas uh, Southern University um, Presidential Achievement Medal for her work in teaching research and community service. In other words, uh, she's been working uh, to uh, explore and to highlight the role of African Americans in, in uh, the uh, Texas experience uh, for quite a while now. So it's my pleasure to introduce her at this point, and she will provide our welcome. Thank you, Frank. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Space City of Houston. Uh, I would also like to welcome you to the 2016 Battle of San Jacinto Symposium. I'm extremely pleased to bring greetings to everyone who assembled here today, to bring greetings to a conference on African American in Texas history from Spanish colonial time to annexation, an area often dubbed as the least studied and identified with the history of African American in Texas. Yet African Americans have been a part of the landscape of Texas for as long as Europeans and their descendants. Spanning a period of more than five centuries, African American presence began in 1528 with the arrival of Esther uh, Vasio, an African slave who accompanied the first Spanish explorer to the land of the southwestern part of the United States that would eventually become the state of Texas. 
in examining African American in colonial Texas. This conference followed the admonition of Ra Raja Latchett who argued that the art of history progresses more from literature that fills gap in our knowledge than from the endless reinterpretation of well-known evidence. With the publication of growing numbers of monographs by our esteemed colleagues and presenters here today, as well as numerous articles and entries in the Handbook of Texas and some chapters in specific studies, this symposium can serve as a prism through which we examine the presence of black people as a member of multi-ethnic antebellum community. To be sure, social studies and Texas history teachers, as well as professional and lay historians and simply lovers of Texas, should find this conference exciting because it supplements and to some extent correct the existing text on African American in Texas. Yet for all that have been written about African American in the colonial period and the amount of literature that rolls off the press constantly, we still know woefully little about the area that we will be discussing today. No doubt, this symposium will help us to gain a better understanding of Afri the African American experience in the Lone Star State and should inspire each of us to do more in seeking to reconstruct the African-American past in the Longstar State. Speaking of reconstruction, this is what we are doing at Texas Southern to help reconstruct this past. Marjorie Brown is uh, researching Great Britain relationship with the Republic of Texas. Jesse Esperazzo uh, is, uh, is doing a collaborative study of African-American and Mexican-Americans starting with uh, colonial Texas. And I am still looking for interest on African American and Spanish colonial Texas for the Handbook of Texas. So, if, and if you have it, please see me afterwards. Again, I would like to thank the participants, the organizers, the committee, and sponsors of this event. Special thanks goes to Barbara Eve, Deborah Braylock Sloan, Frank De Tejas, and James Chris, who would not let me forget this event even if I tried. So sit back and enjoy this conference, a conference that promises to shed new light on the past and to present enormous possibility for future research in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petrie. Uh, up next, I would like to introduce uh, another co-moderator, and he will handle most of the app, uh, this morning speakers, uh, Jim Crisp. Even with a titanium hip, I can handle that big step. Uh, I want to thank you for coming, and also thank the organizers going back 16 years now of the San Jacinto Symposium, I can truly say that I have benefited far more from coming to these events than I could ever have contributed. Um, I am very pleased uh, about one particular thing that I think I contributed this year, and that is the artwork. Not that I did it myself, but I had seen a display uh, a year ago at Rice University uh, uh, in a lecture by Elizabeth Hayes Turner that featured these two murals that are on your program done by uh, Aaron Douglas for the Texas Centennial in 1936 for what was then called the Negro Building at the Texas Centennial. Um, aspiration and into bondage. Uh, actually, the reverse is more true, into bondage and then aspiration. You'll notice that each one has a subtle five-pointed star uh, appropriate for the Texas Centennial. It's not easy to find art that captures the experience of African Americans in early Texas. And this was one of the few examples that we could find that seemed appropriate for this conference. Those of you who have read anything I've written know that when I first started looking at Texas history uh, as a grade school student, um, I was studying a whitewashed past. 
It wasn't until I got to graduate school that I had ever heard of a fellow named Juan Seguin. I had to go to Connecticut to hear about Juan Seguin. Um, and as I and some of my fellow students of history began to dig into the actual evidence, the actual documents, what we discovered is that we had been taught, especially as students and citizens of Texas in the 1950s and 60s, a very limited history of Texas. I've been accused by some people of political correctness. Why are you always trying to include all these people from multiple cultures in Texas? That's not political correctness. That's historical correctness. That means looking at the people who are here and looking at their world through their eyes. Until you've done that, until you've looked at the world through the eyes of the people who were here, you're not a historian yet. And so I'm very pleased uh, of the success of the San Jacinto Symposium in the last few years of bringing this reality to the forefront in these three uh, sessions that we've done that Joe Nelson talked about before. Two years ago, focusing on Tejanos, the Mexican Texans, last year looking at Native Americans, uh, with some uh, absolutely world-class historians, and then this year looking at the African-American American experience in early Texas. Um, one of the things you think about when you're first looking at history as a young person, and this is how we're often taught, is that the good guys are all good, and the bad guys are all bad. Uh, in the case of my particular field, the Texas Revolution, it seemed that much of the historiography of the late 19th and early 20th century focused on race. Not directly, but indirectly, by suggesting that the cause of the Texas Revolution was ethnic cleavage between Anglo and Mexican, and to put it bluntly, as some of those historians did, that superior races should not be governed by inferior races, and therefore you have a Texas Revolution. As I lived through the 60s and 70s, as you had very new ideas and new people coming into the study and writing of history, what often happened is that the heroes and villains simply got switched. And instead of race as a reality, then they talked about racism, which is a much more sophisticated way of talking about history, but they tended to do it, if you'll pardon the expression, in, sh in, in not shades of gray, but in black and white. Now the good guys had become bad, and the bad guys had become good, and the cause of the Texas Revolution was racism on the part of all those Anglos coming into Texas. I was privileged to be able to dive into the actual documents in graduate school and beyond and discovered the complexity of history and the way people managed to sometimes overcome their history and in other cases become inundated by the forces that Andrew Torget is gonna to talk about later today, those enormous economic forces that were active in Texas as the cotton economy spread from the United States to North Mexico and into Texas and shaped people's lives. We've all been shaped by forces that we only gradually come to understand and never quite completely. Philip Shaw Paladin, a great historian, once said, you can't escape history, but you don't want it to come up and hit you by the side of the head when you haven't studied it enough to know what's happening and what helped shape you and me. So I am very pleased uh, to begin the introductions today uh, with uh, my co-moderator, a person who has brought new energy and new strength over the last several years to the San Jacinto Symposium. Uh, <clears throat> one of his many titles 
is the supple professor of history. Um, a very appropriate name, Frank. Uh, Frank is capable of supple thinking. He is, uh, he is a man who always brings to me new ideas, new ways of looking at things. Frank, for those of you who haven't read your program, was the first ever state historian of Texas, uh, a well-deserved honor. Uh, he's had a few successors. As Frank told me, that's one of those jobs with a lot of duties and no salary. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Frank, no one could deserve that more than you. But, but, uh, <laughs> but um, Frank is going to talk to us today about the, sp the Spanish period and the African-American experience uh, in, in, Spanish, in, uh, in Spanish Texas. Um, he uh, brings to this enormous erudition, uh, enormous experience. He was for many years the book review editor of the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. Um, as supple professor at Texas State University, uh, his reach extends far beyond what used to be the little town of San Marcos uh, that's now metastasizing all over that area between New Braunfels and, and Austin. But uh, F Frank uh, is, uh, one of those people who came to Texas as soon as he could uh, uh, by way of Cuba and New Jersey. Uh, and don't hold it against him. Uh, he, has, uh, he has demonstrated the ability to bring people to history and to bring history to people in a rare way uh, in, in his adopted state. And uh, I want you to give him a nice welcome as he comes up. Yeah, I don't want to Uh, thank you, I, I think. Um, the, um, the fact that, um, well, Jim and I have known each other at least since 1994, and uh, we've been ribbing each other, um, I think, practically since the day we met. Um, and so uh, we, we, have a, we have a special bond um, because we, we both think that um, there's more to the story of the Texas Revolution than how Davy Crockett died. Um, the, uh, as, 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 as heretical as that might seem to, to uh, much of the audience. Um, but uh, I would like to say, before I, uh, before I start, um, that um, I've been uh, studying early Texas history now since uh, 1982. Um, and um, before that, I really hadn't even made the connection between my name and the state, uh, the state's name. Uh, people, in fact, keep trying to add an S to the end of my name, and I have to keep correcting them, uh, pointing out that my name comes from the Spanish for roof tile. Uh, which is what a teja is, a, uh, one of those clay red roof tile that one sees on Mediterranean style buildings, uh, and that the name of the state comes from a Catawan word meaning friend or ally. Uh, and I hope I have been friendly, but that's not where my name comes from. Uh, although on more than one occasion I have told people that yes, the state was named after my family. Um, <laughs> So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, yep, we're up. Oh, there it is. OK. Um, I would like to start this morning uh, by, by stating a couple of points uh, on which my presentation uh, turns. Uh, first, the history of people of African descent in Spanish America, uh, specifically in the part known as New Spain. Uh, and New Spain is uh, much greater than what is Mexico today. New Spain in, included uh, Central America. Uh, technically, as a vice royalty, it included the Caribbean islands. And in fact, New Spain, technically, the vice royalty of New Spain actually extended all the way out to the Philippines. Um, so it was a massive 
administrative unit. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about that massive administrative unit. We're going to keep it to what it is today, uh, Mexico and, um, and its uh, northern wayward extension. Well, I guess I have one more aside, and that is my, my frontier does not move from east to west. My frontier moves from, nor from south to north. Uh, mine is a, a Hispanic frontier, full of frontier people, full of pioneers. Uh, they just happen to be Spanish uh, and mestizo, and uh, they happen to be uh, Catholic. Uh, they couldn't be anything else um, in the Spanish world. You had to be Catholic, that was it. Um, but they were nevertheless um, frontiersmen, pioneers, and, uh, and appropriated uh, many of the same characteristics as those Anglo-American frontiersmen. There were many, many points of comparison between them. Um, and race being one of them, although race is distinctive in the case of, of the Mexican frontier. Um, so uh, this distinction um, is, um, is one that is part of my talk today to bring a realization to you that uh, race is in fact part of the northering, instead of westering, frontier experience of, of New Spain, of Mexico. Although slavery was at the core of the African experience in both societies then, uh, the very different historical backgrounds of early modern Spain and Britain um, means that the concept that we call race uh, was distinctive in each. And, and, I'll, and I'll explain a bit later um, what I mean by that. Uh, you'll see in the course of, of my talk um, that um, the, the, the legal uh, and the social manifestation of race in the Mexican context is distinctive uh, from what we traditionally think of it in the, in the American context. The second point is that the story of, of Africans in Mexican society is largely an unknown uh, story because we tend to associate Mexico with its indigenous societies. So we don't think of Mexico as an Afro uh, or an African descent space, and yet it was for centuries. Um, it had a heavily uh, African presence uh, throughout the first two centuries and then um, a broad Afro-Hispanic Afro presence in the 18th century. So we're, we're talking about a much longer experience with the African diaspora than we have in the American, in the, in the North American, in the English context, by, by a century. Um, so that's my second point, that by extension, the story of people of African descent in Texas um, has seen uh, something of, of a recent uh, um, dawning. Um, and um, a as, as Merlene pointed out a little while ago, a lot needs to be done uh, to fully understand that experience in Texas. But it was experience that runs through the entire history of the state. So we don't start the African-American history of Texas in 1823 uh, or 1822 with Stephen F. Austin, we need to go back a century. We need to go back two centuries to see what that, that, that African experience in, in Texas is like. So this morning, I'm interested in, in giving you a good idea of how colonial Mexico's racialized society developed. Uh, in the 300 years before Mexican independence and how that society expressed itself in Texas. To do that, I have to take you back to the time before Spain launched the modern age of empires at the beginning of the 16th century uh, and make some general observations. The first of these uh, is that slavery uh, has been uh, part and parcel of every civilization for which we have a record, bar none. Uh, in some contexts, uh, it was the consequence of losing a war. Uh, prisoners of war became part of the winner's prize. In some societies, it was the result of economic failure. Selling yourself or a family member to someone else was necessitated uh, by an inability to feed your family. And in some places, slavery was hereditary. 
certain groups in society had from time immemorial been the unfree labor force of others. A second aspect of slavery is that it is not necessarily a function of race. In Mesoamerica, that is the world of the Aztecs and Mayas, slaves were either prisoners of war or debtors, which was also the case in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world. Think of the Hebrews in Egypt. Joseph brought his family there to escape famine back in Canaan. And in the course of time, they became slaves of the Egyptians. Not a racial thing, both groups were Semitic. And slavery continued, slavery continued to be a part of the civilizations that succeeded the early ancients. Greek and Roman society both relied on the labor and creativity of slaves, some of whom were fellow Greeks and Romans, and others of whom were North Africans or Eastern Europeans, the Slavs from which our word slave comes from, for instance. Uh, while early Christians acknowledged the inequality of all before God, many of them also accepted the early practice, the earthly practice of slavery. As Paul's letter to the Ephesians makes clear, Islam also accepted slavery as a legitimate social status, something that more recently has become particularly problematic with the rise of, of ISIS, uh, ISIS's attempts to revive that early medieval form of, of Islam. So consequently, medieval Spain, which produced the men who followed Columbus in the enterprise of the Indies, was very familiar with Africans, particularly North Africans, and slavery. It was part of the Spanish social DNA. As part of the Mediterranean world, slavery was part of Spanish society and Christians fighting to take back the peninsula from Muslims and Muslims uh, raiding Christian towns and ports regularly enslaved each other. At the monastery of San Juan de los Reyes, the, monocle, the manacles uh, and chains removed from rescued Christian slaves were added to the main facade of the church in 1494, a couple of years after the fall of the last Muslim kingdom on the peninsula, Granada. Spanish galleys that plied the Mediterranean were powered by enslaved oarsmen and prisoners condemned to that hard labor, very hard labor, just as the galleys of other nations, including the Grand Turk, as he was known, uh, were. When Christopher Columbus decided to take back to Spain a handful of Indians on his first voyage, he didn't ask their permission. During his second voyage, he organized the return of a large number of Indians to be sold as slaves in Spain. This action tells us a couple of things. First, that Columbus considered the enslavement of the indigenous people of the New World as part of the economics of his voyage. He had to pay his creditors and gold, precious gems, and people were all the same. Second, that slave markets existed in Spain to accept the human cargo being sent back. It would have done no good to send back slaves to sell if the mechanisms to do so did not exist. And third, for Columbus and his followers, slavery was not a function of, of race, but rather of circumstance. Indians were different from Africans, but they were also different from Christian Europeans. The first Afro-Iberians, that is, Africans incorporated into Iberian civilization or born in Iberia. Um, Spain itself had a, a, a substantial uh, population with African roots. Began arriving in the Indies with Columbus. The pilot of the Nina may have been a mulatto, and there were at least a couple of Africans on his fourth voyage in 1502 one of whom may have been the first African slave in the New World. A couple of years later, the king authorized the slave trade 
between Spain and the new colonies. Juan Garrido, a native of West Africa who lived in Portugal and then in Spain, became a Christian in Lisbon, where he may have achieved his freedom. By 1502, he was in Hispaniola, uh, today the Dominican Republic in Haiti. And in the following years, he participated in the conquest of Puerto Rico and Cuba. He followed Hernán Cortés on the expedition to the mainland in 1519 and was recognized as a conquistador. After the conquest of the Aztecs, he settled on the outskirts of Mexico City and is credited with having planted the first wheat on the mainland. Subsequently, he even led a couple of gold mining expeditions that included slave gangs. In a later campaign that explored Baja California, Cortes included about 300 blacks and uh, free and enslaved, and enslaved Afro-Iberians accompanied other conquistadors to North and South America. It's impossible to put accurate numbers to either the free or enslaved uh, members of these expeditions or early settlements. But one point is that unlike the first English arrivals in Virginia or Massachusetts a century later, Spaniards arrived in the New World with a fully formed institution of slavery in their civilization toolkit. Another point is that Spanish behavior toward their African companions reflected a less racialized attitude than would govern English colonists in later centuries. Enslaved African conquistadors could and did gain their freedom, acquire property, and might even hold public office. A third point, which I haven't talked about so far, is that some of these Iberian-born blacks who participated in the early settlement of the Indies were mulatos. That is, they were of mixed Spanish African parentage. Thus, the process of race mixing was a recognized part of the Spanish enterprise of the Indies from the very beginning. As the Spanish imperial program expanded in the mid-16th century, so did the African slave trade. The, num the number of Afro-Iberians present in the New World was never large and was inadequate to the needs of the new colonies, uh, which meant that, of course, you couldn't import black slaves from Spain itself. There just weren't enough to supply the increasing demand for labor. Uh, in many instances, um, th that uh, the, because of the indigenous population suffering a catastrophic um, decline, there was a demand for um, a new labor supply, and that labor supply, of course, led to the direct forced migration from Africa. Uh, they quickly, uh, th this new population of, of Afro-Hispanics, and that's what a term I'll, I'll be using quite a bit, um, we quickly replaced the Afro-Iberian migration. Um, and it picked up steam after 1580 when Philip II uh, acquired the title of King of Portugal and was able to then tap into the Portuguese empire, which had at that early date an almost complete monopoly on the African slave trade. Um, that relationship of Spain and Portugal being under the same monarch lasted until uh, 1640, and it's very interesting. By then, about 275,000 Africans had made the Middle Passage to New Spain. Uh, after that, the, it, it's like a spigot got turned off, and Mexico receives virtually no new um, African uh, enslaved um, migration. The demographic collapse of the indigenous population began to reverse in the middle decades of the 17th century, uh, and that combined uh, with the loss of the Portuguese uh, part of the, uh, of the crown um, led to the rapid decline in the importation of enslaved Africans. As the cost of importing Africans outweighed their profitability, imports almost completely ceased. 
From then on, the Afro-Mexican population relied on natural growth to exist, which meant that the number of people of purely African ancestry declined while those of mixed parentage increased. In 1646, for instance, the total population of over 1.7 million in New Spain um, included a population of uh, bozales, that is, people who were born in Africa, Ladinos, those who were American um, born, and uh, they outnumbered, and these two groups, that is, bozales and Ladinos, African born and, and Mexican born, um, outnumbered the Spanish population by 35,000 to about 14,000. So there were three times as many people of African origin living in Mexico than there were people of Spanish origin. If you include the mixed Mexican, uh, the, the mixed African-Mexican population, that is African and Indian or African and Spanish uh, mixed blood population, you get a total of another 117,000 people. So Africans make up, or the, uh, both the enslaved and free population make up a majority of the non-Indian population of Mexico. There's still over a million Indians, pure Indians. But if you, once you take out the Indian population, the majority of people in 17th century Mexico had African blood. By 1810, the number of Afro-Mexicans had increased to over 600,000 people, about 10% of the total population, which was still overwhelmingly indigenous. This population growth was in large part the result of miscegenation among enslaved and free blacks, Spaniards, Indians, and mestizos. By the late 18th century, Afro-Mexicans lived in every part of the viceroyalty, occupied positions in every sector of the economy, and made up a significant portion of the empire's racialized social order, commonly referred to as the sistema de castas. It would be wrong of me to leave an impression that the interactions of Africans and Spaniards did not involve resistance to enslavement and abuse. As early as 1503, Spaniards on Hispaniola notified the crown of black cimarrones, which is the root uh, of the word uh, maroon. Um, something that uh, you'll hear more about uh, in a little while. Um, blacks revolted in Mexico in 1537 and 1612 in Mexico City. And the latter conspiracy led to the hanging and beheading of 36 African men and women. In the late 16th and throughout the 17th century, communities of runaway Afro-Mexican uh, slaves challenged the Spanish state for shorter or longer periods of time. During the 17th century golden age of piracy, men of African descent participated in resisting Spanish rule by plying their criminal trade in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. So, and you don't, you don't, you don't get that from Pirates of the Caribbean, do you? Um, as it happens, the African presence in Texas dates to the age of conquest. Esteban, or Estebanico, one of the four survivors of the Panfilo de Narvaez uh, expedition to Florida, that wrecked on the Texas coast in 1528 was the slave of Andres Dorantes, who happened to also survive to tell the story. Esteban was described by uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, second in command of the expedition and chronicler of the survivors' adventures in Texas and the Southwest as a, quote, black Arab from Azamor, a coastal Moroccan town that had been captured uh, by the Portuguese in 1513. Uh, the Francisco Vasquez de Coronado expedition, which crossed the Texas Panhandle in 1541, also included black slaves, seven of whom 
belonged to Coronado himself. Enslaved and African blacks, uh, enslaved and free blacks were almost certainly part of the DeSoto Moscoso expedition, which crossed portions of western Louisiana and eastern Texas the following year. Although the accounts make no mention of Africans, uh, a history written by one of the participants claims that one company was led by an officer who, quote, traveled with a very splendid and brilliant company of Portuguese gentlemen, some of whom had fought on the African frontiers. And gentlemen always had servants, enslaved or free. And so it is, although they're not recorded specifically, I'm sure that Africans participated in the, in the travels of the DeSoto expedition throughout the southeastern United States and into Texas. By the time Mexican frontiersmen probed the region of the Rio Grande and beyond in the late 17th century, their numbers included considerable numbers of Afro-Mestizos. At least one Afro-Mexican, Juan de la Concepcion, accompanied the Domingo Ramon 1716 expedition that carried out the permanent settlement of East Texas. Two years later, Governor Martin Alarcón brought Afro-Mexicans to Texas as part of the expedition that founded San Antonio. The Marques de San Miguel de Aguayo, whose 1721-1722 campaign completed the permanent occupation of Spanish Texas, uh, including the founding of the Presidio Mission Complex at La Bahia, also included Afro-Mexicans. Consequently, People of African descent have been part of the Texas story from the beginning of the province. That means that from the very beginning, Spanish Texas was a racialized society. The evolution of the sistema de castas that I spoke about earlier had been in full motion for two centuries and had created a complex social order that operated uh, although in a very quirky way, um, impossible to fully understand by uh, the, even people who've studied it for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, it operated even on the frontier, where race mixing was the order of the day. Spaniard Indian, Spaniard Black, Indian Black, and the offspring of the union of those various complications uh, were placed on a hierarchy in which those of pure Spanish blood occupied the top rung. In law and in society, being Spanish conferred privilege and protection from corporal punishment. So, consequently, the closer one's features approximated European standards, the greater the opportunity to pass. The sacramental records where births and marriages were recorded provide plenty of evidence that an individual's place in the, on the social, social racial hierarchy was the arbitrary decision of the priest writing down the information. Because military service was considered to be a Spanish occupation, at least on the northeastern frontier, muster rolls consistently listed men as Spaniards during their active service, only to see them fall into the ranks of the castas, that is, people of mixed race, upon retirement. Oops. By the way, if you've noticed that I've uh, avoided using the term white, it is because it was not a term employed in the Spanish world. Spaniards came in two flavors, European-born and New World-born. In fact, the term casta, or caste, provide some idea of the complex way in which Spanish society considered race. It wasn't necessarily color that was important, but your status. That, thus, it was even possible to buy your way into being a Spaniard. Through a purchased instrument known as the Gracias al Sacar, a successful Afro-Hispanic could buy Spanishness. It might not help the individual socially, but it made him legally Spanish in a hierarchical legal society, which, as I said earlier, privileged Spaniards. But what it also meant is that there were Afro-Hispanics with money, because you had to purchase that privilege from the king. And so it cost a considerable amount of money. 
So again, we're talking about a, a very complex social order in which race is not, pardon the expression, black and white. All these other mixers, uh, mixes are taken into consideration on their own. Consequently, past historians have mistakenly taken at face value the racial identities reported in Spanish colonial censuses of Texas. The 1792 civil census for Texas, uh, which excluded the military population, counted 415 mulatos and 40 blacks in a casta population of 2,961. 367 individuals fell in the other category. Just couldn't, the, the, the census takers couldn't figure out where to put them. Um, which point out just how mixed up and ambiguous this frontier uh, mestizo society could be. Next door to Texas in Laredo, which was not part of Spanish Texas. Laredo was part of Tamaulipas, uh, what was then called Nuevo Santander. Um, and didn't become a Texas jurisdiction until uh, 1848 at the end of the Mexican War. The 155 mulatos out of a total population of 718 residents made them the second largest ethnic group behind Spaniards. The interesting thing is that toward the end of that decade and into the 19th century, the number of mulatos declined dramatically pointing not to their disappearance, but into their absorption into the mestizo category. In other words, at the end of the colonial period and during the Mexican period, what there is is a collapse of this earlier colonial racialized social structure and, it, and the word mestizo becomes a generalized term for people of mixed race. But these mestizos earlier Many of them would have been identified as mulatto. Just as in colonial society in general, Afro-Tejanos occupied every level of the economy, from landowner to slave, and from blacksmith to day laborer. The province's first official census, taken in 1779, includes mulatto farmers, tailors, masons, blacksmiths, carpenters, field hands, and day laborers. Pedro Huizar, who was listed in the 1779 census as a mulatto, but whose racial identity uh, would improve over the years as he became a successful member of the community, appears in, in, in that census as a sculptor. In fact, he is credited with um, sculpting the rose window uh, at Mission uh, San Jose. His engineering and managerial skills would lead him to numerous government assignments and offices, so that by the 1798 census, uh, the census takers had no problem listing him as a Spaniard with the additional honorific of Don. So he had become Don Pedro Huizar. In 1779, he's a mulatto, a free mulatto sculptor. In 1798, he is Don Pedro Huizar, uh, the magistrate for uh, one of the missions. By the time Texas was founded in the early 18th century, reliance on Afro-Mexicans for field work, as was the case in the plantations of the Caribbean and parts of South America, was quickly receding in Mexico. Indian labor, both free and unfree, was less expensive and more manageable. Thus, enslaved Afro-Mexicans made up only a small proportion of the population in Mexico, and especially so in Texas. The one place that experienced, um, that experienced an increase in the enslaved population of African heritage at the end of the 18th century was actually at Nacogdoches. And it makes sense. Although the number of slaves there was still small, the large number with French and English surnames. So you have Afro-Tejanos who have French surnames, who have uh, English surnames living in East Texas demonstrates recent arrivals from Louisiana. You'll be hearing more about some of what that means in, in a bit in the next talk. Um, and another interesting difference between East Texas and the rest of the province at the beginning of the 19th century is that while females outnumbered male slaves elsewhere in late colonial Nacogdoches, the male slaves outnumbered the females, 39 to 36. 
Both the number and the gender balance tell us how quickly East Texas was being integrated in the American Southern socioeconomic system, even before Texas uh, uh, and Mexico became independent. Despite the growth of American influences, both the continued practice of the casta system and the Spanish legal tradition meant that Afro-Texans, including enslaved ones, had access to rights and protections not found in the United States. Enslaved people in the Spanish world could seek justice for crimes committed against them and had the right to seek a change of master or even to purchase their freedom. The practice of manumission at the death of the owner was to be found even in Texas. Juan Flores de Abrego, for instance, freed a female slave at his death in 1779, but required a male slave to continue serving his wife until her passing and then to be included in his estate. So again, people are being treated as individuals. One slave can be freed, the other one remains enslaved. Another right that enslaved people held in the Spanish world, uh, one that may seem contradictory, but was part of the imperial rivalries that overshadowed just about all aspects of life in the New World, uh, was the right of asylum by foreign slaves. The surviving correspondence on Texas cases indicates that the, the local uh, and superior officials took seriously both the legal rights of the owners and the individual rights of runaway slaves from Louisiana. You can read the investigations, you can read back and forth, and how do we treat this case, and does, this, the, does the slave have a proper claim? Was he abused by the former masters? Do we, do we need to protect them, or does the property right? These, they, these, they take these issues seriously. Such rights and protections did not mean equality before the law, however. To the contrary, Spanish society was patriarchal and hierarchical from top to bottom. Uh, that's one of the things that I find most difficult to get across to students, uh, and that is we gotta forget about this whole democracy, egalitarian thing. There was nothing egalitarian about Spanish society. Your place by determ was determined by your, your social status and, and a privilege came with certain statuses and, and responsibilities, obligations, duties, and subservience came with other, other status. Um, so uh, the tax code, for instance, distinguished between Spaniards and mestizos who were exempt from the head tax, known as the tribute, and Indians and Afro-Mexicans who were subject to it, something that made passing from mulatto to mestizo all the more desirable. Um, although the Spanish uh, state found very quickly that they had an awful time trying to collect a tribute from, from Afro-Mexicans. Uh, Afro uh, they, they found all kinds of ways of, of, of avoiding paying the tax. So more, mostly it fell on those poor village-dwelling Indians who couldn't leave their village. And so therefore they were easy to find and tax. Just like us, we're easy to find and tax. Um, as a war zone province, uh, because of Indian hostilities. Texas was exempt from this and other discriminatory tax measures, but not so in the case of punishment. For example, the 1751 regulation of cattle slaughters uh, uh, sp uh, punished Spaniards breaking the rules with a substantial fine of 25 pesos, but imposed a penalty of 200 lashes on castas. The thinking being that if you are a Spaniard, you can afford the fine, and if you are not a Spaniard, you can't afford the fine, and you, in addition, you are being additionally disrespectful, so you're subject to corporal punishment. Um, at the end of the 18th century, Governor Manuel Munoz's ordinance restricting contacts with Apaches imposed a fine on Spaniards and added a jail sentence to Castas. Uh, the use of corporal punishment on castas, including Afro-Texans, was based on, on these racialized attitudes that equated Spanish status with prosperity and casta, Indian, and African status with, with poverty. Um, 
and subservience. And, and, and you can beat your wife and you can beat your, your, your servants and you can beat your slaves. That's just the way things work. Thus, the discriminatory nature of the Spanish legal system was based on deeply ingrained cultural attitudes that equated African des descent with undesirable social and economic characteristics. Despite Afro-Mexicans obvious economic success and participation in every aspect of uh, social life, uh, the term mulatto and mulatto dog were commonly employed as insults. Uh, for instance, Governor Domingo Cabello wrote to his superior officer of the prominent Menchaca family, uh, whose head, Luis Antonio Menchaca, had been the Presidio commander uh, at San Antonio in the 1760s, and others of whom were in military service throughout the region, including commanders of other presidios. Uh, and he said that the Menchacas were, quote, no more than poor mulatos. Ironically, and this is, this is a great irony. Uh, one of Luis Antonio's sons libeled, or so this fellow soldier said, uh, years later by declaring him a mulatto dog. I have written about the relationship between race, honor, and gender in a piece um, where a missionary at Mission Valero tried to marry one of his Indian charges to the daughter of one of the soldiers who had been reassigned to San Antonio following the closing of the Presidio at Los Alaes in what was then East Texas. In opposing the marriage, her brothers and uncles protested that the marriage uh, to a lowly Mission Indian would dishonor them as soldiers and Spaniards to which the missionary on behalf of his Indian protege responded that, quote, being mulattoes, although they are soldiers, neither are they Spaniards nor of better status or of better or purer blood than that of an Indian, carrying with them the tarnished honor that their origins give them and, they shall, and that they shall take to the grave. No wonder then that people accepted opportunities to pass out of mulatto status when possible, and that at the end of the colonial period, um, the term mestizo becomes a more neutral way of, uh, because there were so many mixed blood people that if you just use a more generic term like mestizo, uh, you can get away from the pejorative connotations of, of mulatto. And by the way, uh, that essay is one of the chapters in my new book, which is out for sale outside um, at Faces of Behar. Uh, so run out and get one. I'll be happy to sign it for you during the rest of the day. <laughs> Slavery, both African and Indian, remained enough in, of a problem in Mexican society at the end of the colonial period that in 1813, the rebel government led by uh, Father Jose Maria Morelos, uh, himself an Afro uh, mestizo, uh, of Afro mestizo descent, abolished slavery and the casta system in Mexico. Um, that deed did not survive Morelos's capture uh, and dis the destruction of the revolutionary government. And when it gained independence in 1821, Mexico still had about 3,000 slaves. A few of them actually lived in Texas. And by the way, Morelos is, is interesting. Uh, he was a priest, but, uh, uh, but like many priests in Mexico, um, he, 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 he did have a concubine and he did have a family. And his son, um, he sent to Louisiana, to New Orleans for an education. Uh, that son would grow up to be Juan Almonte and um, was ambassador to the United States for a while, uh, was an aide de camp to Santa Ana, uh, was captured at, uh, at San Jacinto. So even there, we've got a connection to the, to the, off, the, to the uh, origins of the San Jacinto Symposium there. And so uh, Juan Almonte himself had Afro, um, uh, African um, uh, ancestry. Once again, in 1822, the Congress that met in Mexico City to form a new government reiterated Morelos's aspiration and on 17 September prohibited racial categorization. And that is interesting because almost immediately in the records in Texas 
one sees the complete dropping of all reference to race in official records. It happens overnight. And it becomes frustrating for somebody like me who's actually trying to figure out <laughs> what's going on because all of a sudden there's no reference to race. So the political will of this brand new nation is to foster equality. Doesn't work out that way. In the long run, uh, Indians are still uh, treated uh, very poorly as they continue to be even today in many parts of Tex uh, Mexico. Um, the, uh, but the interesting thing about it is the ideal, the aspiration that a, uh, and they're looking to the United States, but they think they can go with the United States one better. You actually read in their writings that the one big problem they see in the United States is the fact that they've got these slaves and the Mexicans are trying to deal with it. So the, the Texas problem is a really big problem for them during the, the early national period because you have Texas saying, we need slaves, we need slaves, we need slaves, and the rest of the country is saying, no, you don't, no, you don't, you don't. And that becomes part of what's going to become the struggle for Texas independence. Um, the government could not, of course, change Mexican culture overnight. But the principle of racial equality was established. Father Refugio de la Garza, a native of San Antonio, and Texas's representative to Congress um, during the uh, first constitutional period, wrote home to San Antonio optimistically, we are all equal, and without this equality, our rights would not be inviolate and sacred. Indeed, the second, the, the, as I said, the census records post-1822 Texas reveal efforts to match ideals and reality by omitting race as one of the data categories. Nevertheless, the issue of slavery and the status of Afro-Texans would not go away. The arrival of American Southerners with their slave labor-based cotton culture and their attitudes toward people of mixed race would come to play a critical role in the transformation of Texas into the Western outpost of the American slaveocracy in 1860, um, in the 1850s and 1860s, something that um, uh, one of the speakers this afternoon will also address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Uh, one of the first things I began to discover when uh, actually as an undergraduate here in Houston at Rice University is that when people from the United States began to come into Mexican Texas, their world was turned upside down. They went from a place where race categories were rigid and social categories, class categories were very fluid to a place where social categories and class categories were very rigid, and as Frank has just demonstrated, racial categories were very fluid, and they were confused as they came in. I have one bit of housekeeping. Dave Britton has asked me to tell you that someone, maybe one of you, has left their lights on. A Toyota Avalon, light blue, level two parking, the license plates, the license plate appropriately begins with TX. Uh, and so if that's yours, you need to do something about it at some point. Your choice. Um, another, uh, a person who is a native Houstonian, Rolanda Teal, uh, comes to us today from Natchitoches, Louisiana, another place that was very confusing to people and that contained that kind of rich mix of cultures, black and white and what used to be called red, uh, French, Spanish, uh, eventually English. Um, Rolanda looks at history uh, through uh, lenses of, uh, of her profession as anthropologist, of ethnographer, uh, and as a PhD student at, San, at Stephen F. Austin State University in the field of forestry. What? Forestry? 
Yeah, forestry, as she points out, has its human dimensions. Uh, as we are beginning to learn in the late 20th and 21st century, <coughs> pardon me, the environment has impacts on us, and we have impacts on the environment, and the way we relate to our environment. <coughs> <coughs> there is pollen in Houston as well as North Carolina, I've, I'm discovering. Uh, the way we relate to our, to our environment um, is an important part of history. And one of the things we find in our environment, uh, as Frank has shown in one context, is escape routes. And Rolanda Teal is going to be talking about another kind of escape route. Uh, Frank also talked about insurrections uh, among the people who were oppressed. She's also going to be talking about that. She is um, the author of African Americans in Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana. Uh, she is going to be a very interesting scholar, and I think we'll be paying a lot more attention to her in the future as she begins to explore history through these lenses, looking at us from across the Sabine River, uh, looking at us through the lenses of Forrester, well, I don't know if Forrester is the right uh, term, but <coughs> scholar of forestry and the human dimensions of forestry and ethnology and anthropology. I can tell you this, to, as, a, as, a, as a veteran of this, historians have a lot to learn from anthropologists. Uh, it expands our vision enormously, and I would like to ask Rolanda to come up and expand our vision now. Okay, Frank, you had to make some adjustments. I certainly do. <laughs> uh, yes. yes it is. Okay, I want to first of all say thank you to the San Jacinto Symposium here for inviting me today and also to uh, Frank. Uh, we did a conference a couple of months ago and I, I'm very pleased to be back and to follow him once again. Uh, am I clicking now or are you in charge? Okay. All righty. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today really about an 1804 insurrection that occurred in Louisiana and extended into Texas. Um, uh, but before I even go into that story, I want to give a little bit of background on the geographic area so you have some sense of what we're talking about. And then I'll go into a little background on the social context and then into the story itself. So beginning with this slide right here, I just kind of want to point out what the territory of Orleans looked like in 1805 because it becomes very important in why uh, slaves are leaving Louisiana and what route they decide to take. So if we look up to the, the black on the right there is the territory of Mississippi, which is mostly American. You have Spanish Florida uh, there to the right. The territory of Orleans is all of that newly acquired land that was really part of the uh, uh, 1804 acquisition. Um, but it's all in color there, so you can kind of see that. Uh, right next to Louisiana going west, you have a strip known as the neutral strip, the neutral zone. I'll talk about that just a little bit. And then that is bordered by uh, you know, Spanish Texas. So what you basically have here then are Spanish, French, Americans, all bordering one another. And in between that territory, you have a population of slaves. And so typically, when we think about slave escapes, we talk about it in terms of the Underground Railroad. We know that, in, well, what we have always been taught is that they left from the South, and they followed the North Star, and they made their way towards Canada. But imagine living here in Louisiana, which you really want to start out going towards Canada, when you can just go west about 15 or 20 miles and be in Spanish territory and free. And so we have to rethink those stories we've heard about what the Underground Railroad represented in the route of travel, because in Louisiana, they did not go north, they went west to Texas, and then further on into like places like San Antonio and down into Mexico, which is why you will find uh, many, more than you probably know about, uh, communities in Mexico that are predominantly uh, people of African descent. 
That's where they went. So what we're going to focus on, if you look at this map, in the red there at the left, sort of, kind of, is Natchitoches Parish. I'm going to be talking about a story that starts in Natchitoches Parish, goes through the neutral zone, and on into Texas. Okay, and I just kind of want to give you this, this, this little map thing so you can see what we're talking about. If you see Natchitoches there, uh, right next to it, within about 15 miles was Los Adias. Los Adias, uh, of course, was the capital of Spanish Texas for a while. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you look at it in, in those terms, what you're talking about then is that you could be enslaved right there in French Natchitoches and in 15 miles be in Spanish Texas and free. So that becomes a draw card, then, for many of them to travel that way. Later, after Los Adias closes and Nacogdoches, Texas, is formed, the enslaved simply reset their routes. And so now they're not going to Los Adias, but they're basically using the same route to continue on into Nacogdoches. So basically, what we're talking about here is an escape route that encompasses approximately 120, 130 miles. So that's the, the geographic background. That's pretty much where I'm going to be staying. Now, to give a little bit of information here on Los Adias, Los Adias, uh, as I stated, was the capital of Texas for quite a while. Uh, that census uh, note that I have there is really not accurate uh, for Los Adias. That is the census record that was taken in Nacogdoches just in Natchitoches, Louisiana, I'm sorry. And the reason I point that out there is that when you look at the total population at the time, 54 people, and you look at, at that time, both uh, African descended and Indian slaves were in Natchitoches, that together they comprised almost the majority of the population. Uh, and this was right after Los Adias formed. Of course, Los Adias formed, it was supposed to be there as a, as a, as a mission and all, but mostly to stop French encroachment into Louis, into Texas. So uh, as a fort and, and mission, Los Adias was, uh, was a borderland society. Everything really took place in San Antonio. And it functioned much like a borderland society in that they were really very poor farmers. Um, they very seldom had the proper equipment that they needed, few guns, so they really couldn't have defended themselves had they wanted to. And because of this, they were oftentimes then uh, engaged in trade uh, across international borders because they were going into France to get some of the supplies that they needed. And back and forth, French citizens were also coming to Los Adias to get certain things that they needed. In this process, um, enslaved people from Louisiana also engaged in trade at Los Adias. That was an acceptable thing to do. And so they would trade sometimes uh, meats and things for silks and chocolates and oils and things that they needed. So Los Adias becomes this place that is a very inclusive society, as Frank mentioned earlier. This was a place where you had a large mixture of French, Spanish, Native Americans that were in the area, uh, all mixing together so that by the time they take a, a, a census in 1731 of just Los Adias, they find it to be a surprisingly inclusive society. And it gains a reputation then throughout the territory of Orleans as a place that you go to when you want to be free and when you want to be in an area that is very multicultural, multiracial. And so very early on in the mid-1700s, that early on, you had slaves leaving from as far south as New Orleans coming up to Natchitoches and crossing over to Los Adias. Because that route is already well established and pretty well known, it simply continues when Los Adias closes its doors and they just continue on into Nacogdoches, Texas. Okay, so that's some of the geographic. We're talking about 15 miles outside. But when we start talking about it in terms of what is happening socially, I want to bring up a concept uh, that was really uh, started by historian Ira Berlin in his book, uh, Slaves Without Masters. He talks about this concept of a slave society versus a society with slaves. In a uh, 
slave society, uh, there is, uh, well, let's, let's, let's do it in the reverse. In a society with slaves, that's kind of what Los Adias was. Uh, slaves weren't actually there living, but it had the representation of a society with slaves in that there is no dependence on slave labor as a way to make a living. Uh, if anything, you had a servant, like a house servant or something like that, but there's not this great, you know, cotton production going on and so you need the slave laborers or anything like that. That is then a society with slaves. But when we talk about a slave society, these are societies that have become very dependent on slave labor. The loss of slaves means a loss of wealth. And so any time a slave leaves from that type of society, there is a concerted effort then to get that slave back. And we start to see this happening in Louisiana around the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, as the Americans come in, a lot of people want to say, well, the Americans changed everything. And I'm not going to put that all on the Americans. Yes, they brought some of their uh, thoughts into this process. But as we can see, uh, by 1804, French citizens in Louisiana are already starting to address how do we deal with this issue of slavery and them moving and leaving and disappearing, if you will, uh, at will. And so they develop this policy of slavery. Uh, and they try to be, you know, uh, 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 they haven't totally lost that, that sense of living in a society with slaves. And so they talk about, let's give out some wilderness tracts of lands to the slaves so that they can grow their own vegetables and things, and maybe they will be less tempted to leave. Or let's try to allow for this. You can start to see restrictions also beginning to take place in that now you're not able to ride a horse anymore, because if you have transportation by horse, you might be able to get away quicker. So you start to see some little changes that were not there in existence before. And uh, this is the, the development then of a slave society. In another example that occurs in October of the same year, a group of citizens from Natchitoches came together and they created this pact. So as the farmers, they basically were saying, we're losing so many slaves over here to Spanish Texas. We have to have a way of compensating each other uh, when this happens. So basically what the PAT said is that if, for example, a slave leaves and we form a posse to go after that enslaved person, then any expenses that we incur, if the slave is killed or anything like that, then together everybody that signed this PAT will put in the money to compensate that slave owner. Uh, and so you see this beginning to develop. And if what it speaks to then is that you have a large population of slaves that are leaving and forming these maroon societies. Um, as, as Frank mentioned earlier, uh, he, he just hinted on it, but maroon societies really are those societies that form usually in the swamps and the hill, hills excuse me, of the surrounding areas. These were uh, places where groups of slaves live that chose to not live on the plantations. Um, it was illegal for them to do that, but they stayed in hiding. There's a wonderful book out now that really goes into the life of slaves, and it's called Slavery's Exiles by um, Sylvian Dioff, and I would highly recommend that if you want to know more about maroonage. But if we notice that the letter there, um, uh, that the pact that was created, this was created right there in October, and the story that I'm going to be talking to you about on the insurrection actually occurred on October the 16th, right after this was completed. So I'm calling it the uh, 1804 insurrection from Rivière Con, uh, French, of course. And so what it really means is the insurrection of Cane River. Cane River runs through Nakajish Parish. It uh, used to connect with the Red River. And so therefore, as an escape route, if you're coming from South Louisiana, you simply follow the Red River up where it changes into the Cane. It comes straight into Natchitoches. Once you got into Natchitoches, you headed west. You passed Los Adias and went straight into Natchitoches. Very simple route. You really made one turn. You know, <laughs> coming from New Orleans, you made one turn. And so you see examples throughout the 1700s of people coming from as far as New Orleans, sometimes being caught in Natchitoches before they can make that other 15 miles over uh, into Spanish territory. But what happens in this particular instance, it's October the 16th, 1804, and it's nighttime. 
and a group of slaves to decide that they're going to leave and go to try to obtain freedom in Nacogdoches, Texas. So they began, and the lower right there, in the property that's outlined in green, at the home of a woman by the name of Maria Cave Dupree, and she was a widow at that time. And so what they did was that they traveled along the north, going north along the river, uh, notifying other people, hey, it's time to go. And they did this by a series of whistles that had been handed to them by Spanish soldiers who had been deserters from Spain, from the Spanish colony, I should say, not from Spain, uh, who had come into Louisiana. They traveled back and forth all the time, and they were instigating then the slaves and telling them, hey, if you leave here and come over to Texas, you'll be free. And here, we're going to give you the whistle so that you'll know how to signal one another so that you can come together and come as a group. And that's what they attempted to do on October the 16th, 1804. So as they travel north along the river, all of those properties that are outlined there in green, uh, look on the east, west side of the river, uh, are the places in which slaves left that night. Uh, they used that series of whistles and traveled along so they would know to greet them. At the top uh, left there, kind of looks like little fingers, if you will, in green, is the property of uh, Louis Durban, and that was the last home that they stopped at. But along the way, at each home, they gathered supplies that they thought they would need for their journey. So that by the time they leave the last home of Louis Durban, they had 20 horses, five guns, 20 pounds of powder, and uh, what is that? I can't see. Of bullets, 100 pounds of bullets, right? Okay, so why would they need all of this armory and all of this equipment? Well, one of two reasons. One is that they didn't plan to return at all, and so therefore they needed supplies to whatever destination they were going to, they would have a way to get started. But more than that, on the second reason I believe that they really needed all of this ammunition and all, uh, was that they would need to be able to protect themselves along the way should somebody stop them, and also, particularly as they tried to travel through the neutral zone. <laughs> I think they would have needed a whole lot. The 20 horses, though, I believe was more for expediency, because if you're trying to travel quickly, then you need to be able to change horses frequently. And so the 20 horses, I think, was mostly for that. Can we, can we get on across here in a speedy manner as not to be caught? And so this is what they start out on their journey with. Now, this is another map representing the neutral zone or no man's land. Uh, in the top right uh, on the red is Natchitoches. I'm trying to give you a sense of the area again. The bottom red dot is the Louis de Band homestead, which is where they actually left for, uh, from. And all the way over to the uh, left side of the screen in red is Nacogdoches. So you see the distance was really not that great if you look at it like that. Now in the heavy dark lines, the two lines running north and south is the neutral strip. This was a, 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 an area that was, you know, often referred to as no man's land, the bad lands, because a lot of illegal activity took place here. Uh, this was where many slaves, maybe, who had obtained their freedom uh, might have traveled through that area and then could be re-enslaved because somebody would catch them and take them somewhere else and then sell them again. Uh, it was also in this area that you had places known like uh, the House of, uh, of Bar and Davenport. Uh, I, I put this other little map up here, to because you can see in the uh, dotted square to the right of the Sabine River is an area marked off, and it's called Davenport. Can you guys see that? I didn't have a pointer because they said you wouldn't be able to see it anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> but the house of Barr and Davenport was a trading house that was located right there in the neutral strip. Uh, they had at one time exclusive trading rights with all the Native American groups in the region, but they also traded in slaves. So imagine then a group that's trying to leave, they have to pass through this zone because before they can get into, uh, even though it's supposed to be neutral, it's contested between France and Spain, it's not supposed to belong to anyone. That means that anything that happened there was kind of like up to grass because there was no authority in that area. So you had to pass through this area, and I believe it's because of that that they really had the guns and stuff. Can we make it through this area, at least to the Sabine River? Once they crossed the Sabine, it was a little more, you had a little more uh, chance of being free. So 
Davenport and Barr, the House of Barr and Davenport, um, because they dealt in slaves, uh, and sometimes illegally as well, uh, the, the zone gets set up to be, that's what it's known for. So the, the, the group leaves the plantation, and how do we know they left that and what happened is because, of course, the next morning, after the 16th, when they took off, people realized they were gone, and they started trying to ask questions. So they interviewed a Native American boy who said that he had been in the quarters, in the slave quarters, the night before. And he had heard them talking, telling each other to be confident, to be self-assured, this was the right thing to do kind of thing. And so he knew that they were going to be leaving. And so they got that information about the whistles through the Native American boy. OK. Also, that same night, something happened. And one of the people that was leaving, one of the enslaved, he got uh, disconnected with his group. And the patrollers, because you had patrollers in the woods at all times to help prevent runaways, found him and shot at him. Well, when they shot at him, even though they didn't kill him or anything, he turned himself in, of course, and he became the informer of what was going to happen. During that in, uh, interrogation of him, he implicated that 30 to 40 slaves were supposed to have left that night. So now they're traveling on alone. They come through no man's land. And as they get here to the Sabine River, we have uh, a Spanish fort that, that happened there. There were only two really official ways to cross the Sabine at that time. That was the Patterson Ferry and the Crows Ferry. They were both owned by American men. And so in order to cross that, people would have had to take you across. Uh, the fact that there are no records, at least that I'm aware of th at this time, that indicates that there was any kind of skirmish there, that anything had happened whatsoever, leads me to believe then that, of course, they did not take the ferry because they don't want these kind of things happening. Instead, what they did, and if you look at this map here, is they walked across the Sabine River and rode across on horseback. And of course, if we look at it, this was known as Paso de Salinas. I'm not, I don't have Spanish. My background is French. So I might not be saying that right. But it was known as a Spanish crossing. Why would you need a Spanish crossing there? was one of the questions I asked myself. Well, as I got more into the records, this is, this is what I came to understand. If you remember, I mentioned about you had Spanish military deserters going over into French Louisiana and vice versa. If I am a deserter from the military and I don't want to be caught, it kind of makes me a fugitive. And as a fugitive, I'm not going to travel the main roads and the main highways across the river where everybody else is, everybody else is going to cross. I'm going to go somewhere that I think nobody can detect me. And so what starts to happen then is you start to see what I want to refer to as these fugitive routes. There were fugitive routes in terms of crossings at rivers, but also in terms of what travel route do we take, even as we leave these plantation sites. And so what I've discovered is that there are roads that still exist in Louisiana today that were being used as fugitive routes. And if you look at those roads, they still look pretty much abandoned. You know, still roads that are covered in dirt, red Louisiana dirt, uh, as opposed to being paved and all. And so these are all of what I'm calling fugitive routes. And so the fugitive route across the Sabine River was this pass. Unfortunately, this no longer exists, because when Toledo Bend Dam was put in, this portion was, was put underwater. So it doesn't exist anymore. Many of the Native American uh, communities that existed around there, as well as later African American communities that formed there, are underwater. Uh, when the river is very low, you can still see some of the buildings, because everything was just flooded as once, as, as opposed to being torn down. So anyway, they cross on over. And when they cross over, the next instance we see it says that they were seen passing by the dwelling of Bautista Paferamo. Uh, his place was known as Ranch Chichi. Anybody looking at any of the early Texas uh, maps, any of the early Louisiana maps, this is going to show up, Ranch Chichi. And I believe that this shows up uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, Paferamo was a French citizen who received a Spanish land grant over on the Texas side. So he moves over to the Texas side and starts to form a family there. Uh, if you'll notice, 
if a person is passing in front of his place, there are many things that stand out. He has corrals and fields and homes for slaves and things like that. Now, those of you that are familiar with the Underground Railroad story, they often talked about people traveling north, and what were they told to follow in order to know they were going north? Anybody? North Star. You followed the North Star because you had no other way of knowing what direction you were going in. But now if you're traveling west, how do you know where to go? So part of what I think happens then is just as I was talking about the route from, route from uh, Nor New Orleans on up, you had clues along the way. Uh, I'm traveling, whether it's by boat or land. All I'm seeing on each side of me are woods after woods after woods until I get to Texas and then I see prairie after, no, you know, but <laughs> East Texas you're going to see some. But what you're looking for then are things, landmarkers, if you will, to let me know that I'm going the right way. Now if I follow the Red River, okay, I'm good. Then they tell me it's going to branch off and form and become a split to the, what is now known as the Cane River. Okay, I can follow that. Well, once you got so far, the Lewis DeBan property that I showed you that kind of looked like the little fingers there also makes every map. Anytime you see the DeBan property on the map, you also see Ranch Chi Chi. And I believe those were the indicators that people needed to know that they were on track. Okay, now you've gotten to the DeBan property. The next stop was Natchitoches, which was only less than 20 miles up. You knew once you got to Natchitoches, head west and you headed west along the only real route that existed, and that was what is now today uh, El Camino Real de la Teas, right? It's now a National Historic Trail, but that was the only route, really, unless you went some kind of back road or fugitive route. So it was very easy to follow. You know then, once you got to that point, you went so far, you were at the Sabine. When you get to the Sabine, you tr cross where you can walk. All of these are indicators. And so the same thing here with Ranch Chi Chi. And so they come here, and uh, that is where um, they were followed that far, <laughs> unofficially, by the French. And they turned around and went back. OK, so that left them, the enslaved, free to travel. So now they arrive at the Atoyak River. The Atoyak still exists today. Uh, it intersects at Highway 6. It intersects again at Highway 21. So those of you uh, in Texas, you kind of get some sense of where that is. And it is here that really everything takes place in terms of this insurrection. Uh, I put that picture there on the right to give you a sense of what it looks like today, and nothing would have changed that much from when the slaves there were there. And so it makes a perfect place to hide out if you don't want to be seen. And the reason that they stopped at the Atoyak was that they were trying to figure out what happened to the rest of the group that was coming along. We're going to stay here and wait on them to catch up. If you recall, I said, the patrollers had stopped one guy. Something happened. I still haven't figured out exactly what happened, what went wrong, that everybody didn't leave together. But in the end, out of the 30 or 40 that were supposed to have left, only nine actually made it as far as the Atoyak River. So as they were waiting there to figure out what happened to their uh, accomplices and all, um, they didn't bring food because they thought they would have been where they needed to be by then and not have to wait. So what they did was use the guns and stuff they had brought with them, and they robbed travelers who were traveling along 21 El Camino Real and robbed them of food while they were staying there. So that becomes significant, too, because it's like, how many times do you have enslaved people robbing other travelers uh, uh, in order to get food? So. Once, uh, it is, uh, once they are there and they've been there a few days, what happens on the French side of things is that they have come together and gone to the commandant at Nacogdoches, who was a Sibley at that time, and they're saying basically, hey, our slaves have headed over here to Texas. We need permission to go and try to apprehend them and get them back. But because you're talking about crossing international borders, they couldn't just go and get them on their own. They had to come back and get permission, and so they do. So Alexis Clucci, who was a prominent citizen of Natchitoches, uh, goes 
and gets permission, and he goes towards Nacogdoches, and he goes with his own militia and a couple of, uh, well, I think a free man of color and all, and they go over there in essence to get the slaves. But they have to go directly to Nacogdoches to the post to let the commandant there know, hey, we're in town and this is what we want. We've come in requesting return of these slaves, and of the nine, there was actually one woman and her child as well, and we want them back. So the commandant of Nacogdoches is kind of like, you know, uh, what do I do here? He was new. He didn't know what to do. And he was very typical of many that were in that position. Basically, even though there were supposed to be policies, what happens around slavery there is that because they're in a borderland type situation, kind of on their own, whoever was in charge actually made the decision on the spot as to whether or not slaves were returned. You have to look at the dynamics of the relationships between Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches. Many of the people are in a merit in that some of the Spanish from Nacogdoches were marrying the French from Nacogdoches. And so to kind of keep the family peace and everything else, if, for example, my father-in-law came to me and said, my slaves have just come over into your territory, can I get them back? What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to give them back even though I really didn't have permission yet to do that. And so that kind of becomes the dynamics throughout. So when a slave left in Louisiana going into Texas, it was almost like a 50-50, depending on who was in charge at the time as to whether or not you were returned. So this gentleman then, what he does is he basically is saying, I'm going to go ahead and try to help you at least locate them. And in the meantime, I'm going to send a letter to San Antonio to see what it is that I'm supposed to do in this situation. Now, what I imagine that happened is that Alexis Clucci is there with his own military from, the, from France, from, well, from Spanish Louisiana. Uh, they're sitting there every day kind of waiting, and I'm sure this guy was like, you know what, let's just go and find them, and let's just, you know, get this over with, because it might be three weeks, it might be a month or whatever before I hear back from San Antonio. So he sends out first uh, some uh, Native American scouts to look for them. Uh, they actually end up being part of the Cachada tribe. Um, they return because they did not find them successfully. Then he sends out another Spanish citizen another day or so, and he does locate them at the Atoyag. So he returns back to say, hey, I know where they are. They form a group of uh, people to go, including a few Spanish soldiers, and they return in a couple of days and go out to look for these citizens. And so what they do is on October the 30th, they found them and brought them on back into Nacogdoches. Now, what happens at the river, I mean, what happens when uh, the militia arrives there at the river is kind of interesting, too, because what they report is that when they first arrived, the, the, the enslaved armed themselves with the guns that they had and were ready to fight as it says, willing to defend ourselves from all, including our white masters. Um, what I believe happened, though, is that the Spanish were able to talk to them and say, look, you at least have a chance of being able to stay here if you give yourselves up. But that if you don't give yourselves up, then it's going to be a battle, and we don't know, you know who all is going to make it out. Um, you know, I, we're not clear on what happened as to why they gave themselves up, but clearly they did not have to. They could have fought because they had the, uh, the uh, munitions to do so, and actually they were only outnumbered by one person. So, you know, I, I, I like to believe that that's what happened. The Spanish said, you know, let's try to work it out. So they, they went on back, and when they went back, the commandant decided to turn them on over to Alexis Clucci, who then marched them right on back to Natchitoches. What happens in the meantime, though, is after they get back over to Natchitoches, um, the commandant in Natchitoches receives word from San Antonio that says, if the slaves have not hurt anybody or killed anybody, have not stolen anything, then keep them here and tell Alexis Clucci and company to go back to Louisiana. But the word got there too late. And as a result, the commandant then was actually uh, dismissed of his position and actually served jail time for returning them without having permission to do so. Now, once Alexis Clutchy gets back to Louisiana with the group of enslaved, they are taken and made a public example of. So what they did was take them to the town square, 
they uh, were tied down by stakes and face down, laid down, and, and, and whipped. Uh, the document states that they were whipped in such a way that each time the whip hit their buttocks, it brought out pieces of skin. Uh, and then after that, they were sent on home with their masters. In the meantime, though, the, uh, the government is becoming even more involved. And so at the time, the uh, uh, governor of Louisiana, W.W.C. Claiborne, uh, gets wind of this. He's made aware that this has gone on. And so now there is this desperation, if you will, to put these slaves in check. How do we keep this from happening? How do we make examples? And so what the governor wanted to do was to actually bring them down to New Orleans that they would serve time there. Uh, but Sibley and company wrote a letter basically stating, hey, we need these slaves here. We can't have these are some of our best slaves belonging to some of our best owners here. Uh, we feel satisfied with the uh, punishment that they've been handing out. So, you know, basically, if it's okay with you, we're fine with it. Can we let it go? When they interrogated the slaves, not only did they talk about the fact that the Spanish had come over and persuaded them and all um, to, 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 try to, to try to be free, but the slaves basically said, you know, had it not been for them, we would have been here, we would have been happy. How many of you think that was really the case? I don't. But anyway, that, that's kind of how the, the story went. And so this was meant then basically to discourage any other type runaways, uh, keep people in place and check. And what happens then is that four years later, in 1808, another group leaves. This time, it is 30 people that actually make it. I believe they probably travel the same exact route. They make it to Nacogdoches. And once they arrive in Nacogdoches, they're giving a party, if you will. Uh, I'm referring to it as the Feast of Liberty, because this was something that you saw in, in South America and everything like that. This Feast of Liberty was given to people as they obtained freedom. And so they were given Spanish cocktails, and a dance was handed out. I mean, was given that night in their honor for having made it that far. And then the next day, they were marched off towards the Twin uh, Trinity River, I believe, towards a, a settlement called uh, Salcedo. Uh, we don't know where that is right now. We need a good archaeologist out there on that. I don't have time for it. But um, <laughs> we need to locate that place, because it was there that most of the slaves that made it into Texas, at least initially, were sent to Salcedo. Uh, to live. And what they did was they worked there, just like in Nacogdoches. If you were an escaping slave that made it that far, then usually what you did was work for one of the planters. Work for one of the planters, not be enslaved to them. But that was how you made your living or, or, or uh, compensated them for taking care of you, at least initially. And so the thing was to make it into Nacogdoches, maybe stay there and work a little while, kind of get on your feet, and then move on out. A lot of times that was going straight on down into San Antonio, and other times it was crossing into Mexico and where you formed your own communities. I think that crossing into Mexico probably became even more pre prevalent after 1845 when Texas kind of forms and you know, more and more Americans are crossing on over and bringing in with them their uh, ideas around slavery. Uh, after all this pressure, which I mentioned once before, the back and forth between Spanish government and the French government about what do we do in this 1808 escape, they decide to go ahead and turn them back in as well. When they got to Natchitoches, it's unclear what happens to them, you know, if they were beaten, if they were whipped, if some were sent down to New Orleans for trial or what have you. But the typical thing to do at that time, in Louisiana anyway, is that if slaves were involved in an insurrection, a rebellion, or anything like that, we can look back at the, uh, the, the Pont Coupe conspiracy and things like that, Desahan, Desatran uh, plantation. If you were caught involved in something like that, typically what happened is that you were beheaded, and your head was placed on a stake and lined along the area, a river, whatever, the, around the plantation, as a sign of what will happen to you if you try to escape. So I don't really know what happens to the 18 on 8 group. I'm still looking for that information. It was really only two months ago, wasn't it, February? Uh, when I found out what happened to the 1804 group, and so I'm going to say this publicly. 
The reason I could not find those documents is because they were in someone's private collection and had been all this time. And I know that there is a tendency, especially amongst historians and their family members, that if they find documents that pertain to a pertain to a issue of importance to them or has something that do directly with their uh, ancestors, they want to keep it and hold on to it. But to me, what it's, you know, it's like you're trying to say you're the guardian of history, and I don't believe that that's appropriate, that at the very least, make copies of those documents and put them in an archive or repository somewhere, that that information is available to others. Um, to be a guardian of history, I don't think anyone has the right to be that. So I just need to put that out because I know it's somebody in this room in that same situation. You have documents in your home right now that are beneficial to uh, scholars, uh, local historians that are looking to fill in gaps. And we can't fill those gaps in without those documents being made public. So I just need to put that out there. And, uh, and basically, this is the uh, conclusion of my topic here on the 1804 insurrection from Riviera Khan. Thank you. Usually after a couple of lectures in my profession, there's a test. <laughs> so uh, who can tell me where the largest slave revolt in the United States of America took place? Nope, not Nat Turner in Virginia. New York City? Nope, not New York City. Uh, no, sir? Yes. Well, if you're talking about the Seminoles, yes. that's, a, that's a, a slightly different story because it's much more complex than a, than a classic slave revolt. But it was, in New, it was in Louisiana on the German coast uh, above New Orleans in 1811 in the Louisiana Territory. We're talking about 500 slaves who had to be defeated by the United States Army. Uh, and it, uh, there are some books now available on that. For a long time, it was the least studied and least understood of the slave revolts. And there's still more work to be done on that. But it was enormous. Um, and Louisiana, as a state and as a polity, is still dealing with the question of how do we celebrate and or talk about this slave revolt in our public history. Um, we're running, I beg your pardon? 1811. It was in the Louisiana Territory uh, a year before statehood for Louisiana. Uh, but it was a huge revolt uh, with many, many casualties. Uh, and uh, some of you may know the title of the book. Andrew, do you remember? The, uh, there is a book by a young man uh, who was a student of Walter Johnson at Harvard, who did the book about five years ago. But it's, uh, it's, a, remarkable, uh, it's a remarkable event. Uh, we're uh, ahead of schedule, which is good for us. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do is, instead of coming back at 11.15 on the dot, as your program suggests, I will begin to uh, introduce our next speaker uh, uh, at uh, 10 after 11 and allow him to begin in plenty of time at 11.15. And in the meantime, uh, you're due for a break. And so you're excused.